I think actually today is is sort of a, might be considered the day when um, the cure research agenda moves from the basic science lab into the clinic. Okay, Dr. Margolis on my left um, published today in Nature uh, a really uh, landmark study showing for the first time that you can administer a drug uh, to people who've been on long-term therapy and go after the so-called latent or hidden reservoir of HIV. Uh, absolute uh, critical uh, advancement uh, as we take the concepts that people have been working on for the past 10, 15 years into the clinic. In addition, uh, later on this afternoon, we're going to hear from Dr. Kariskis and his colleagues uh, a report on uh, a couple of bone marrow transplant procedures that appear, at least uh, with preliminary data, to perhaps to have um, uh, done what was done with the Berlin patient, but not necessarily using HIV-resistant uh, T cells. And this is a very provocative, not necessarily definitive study, uh, but I think it's one that's going to be proven to be a, a scientific highlight of the study. And also, there is now, I think, recognition from the work uh, from our French colleagues, and Agir here on my left is going to talk about this, that treatment Standard antiretroviral treatment, when administered early uh, and for a prolonged period of time in a small subset of people, may in fact actually end up in a uh, resulting in a functional cure for reasons that were not clear. But the key thing that links all three of these presentations is that they're truly uh, clinical studies being done in people, providing uh, uh, reason for enthusiasm that ultimately we're going to get to where we need to go, which is a, uh, a way to cure people. HIV infection. Uh, so my colleague, Tim Henrich, and my group studied uh, the persistence of HIV in two HIV-infected men who underwent allogene allogeneic or foreign uh, stem cell transplantation for the treatment of lymphoma. Both patients had been infected for many years and had, not been, on an and had been on antiretroviral therapy that completely suppressed HIV replication, which they continued throughout the time of their transplant. Uh, they, despite being on therapy, uh, they continued to have detectable latent virus in their circulating lymphocytes prior to transplantation. The, these patients, in contrast to the Berlin patient, received a milder form of chemotherapy just before their transplants, and this enabled them to remain on their antiretroviral therapy during the transplant period. Although HIV was detectable in their cells immediately after the transplant, over time, the transplanted donor cells replaced the patient's own lymphocytes, and as this occurred, the amount of HIV DNA that was detectable in the patient's blood cells decreased and eventually became undetectable. One patient has been followed now for nearly two years since his transplant, and the other patient has been followed for three and a half years. No traces of virus could be found in the patient's plasma, nor were we able to recover virus from the patient's purified CD4 T cells by a sensitive culture method. In addition, we observed a significant decline in HIV antibody levels, tests conducted by our collaborator, Dr. Michael Bush in San Francisco, providing additional evidence for a lack of ongoing exposure to HIV antigens. In contrast to the Berlin patient who received cells that were intrinsically resistant to HIV infection because they lack a key HIV receptor, the CCR5 receptor, the cells that our patients received uh, carry CCR5 and are fully susceptible uh, to HIV. We believe that continuous administration of effective antiretroviral therapy protected the donor cells from becoming HIV infected as those donor cells eliminated and replaced the patient's own immune cells effectively clearing the virus from the patient's blood lymphocytes. Tissue sampling and analytic treatment interruption are needed to assess the full extent of HIV reservoir reduction following allogeneic stem cell transplantation. The importance of our findings is that we have evidence now that we can protect uninfected cells from becoming infected when they're transplanted into an HIV-infected patient, a form of PrEP at the cellular level, if you will, and these data give further encouragement to the field and provide another piece of the puzzle as we continue our work towards a cure that will be generalizable and applicable to HIV patients worldwide. So just briefly, uh, there are 
many molecular mechanisms that are understood to allow the HIV virus genome to remain silent and hidden within a specific population of resting CD4 T cells. And um, although there are perhaps other barriers to eradicating infection in people, this is perhaps the best understood and most obvious obstacle. Um, our study uh, took eight patients that, uh, like in Dan's study, maintained their antiretroviral therapy to prevent spread of virus from infected cells to uninfected cells. And we administered a, a new drug, a histone deacetylase inhibitor called Varinostat, in a single dose. And it, during the time period of the exposure of those patients to the effective level of Varinostat in their blood, we then measured the expression of virus within the resting CD4 cell population. And so we showed uh, in a very quantitative way that the expression of latent virus within this reservoir increased significantly for a moment in time after a single dose of this drug. Um, this drug is targeted at uh, the histone deacetylase enzymes. They're a human enzyme, but they're known to be a key mediator of the ability of the virus to hide out in resting CD4 T cells. So this suggests that um, perhaps if we're able to repeatedly and effectively target this or other um, mechanisms that allow latency to persist, we can disrupt latency force the, and force the virus out into the open. The next steps that need to be done in the field, I think, are to understand how this can be done repeatedly and completely effectively within all the, rest, with all the, in, within all the reservoir cells in the body. Uh, completely prevent infection of new cells and perhaps also find ways to rapidly and efficiently clear or kill these infected cells that are expressing virus. In that setting, we might then turn HIV into a virus infection like hepatitis C that needs to constantly be finding new cells to infect uh, or otherwise it, it, the infection is extinguished. And in this case, we could then extinguish HIV infection. So our uh, team is interested in understanding how so individual, uh, uh, some individuals are able to control infection spontaneously. These are called HIV controllers. And as you may know, HIV controllers have uh, some characteristics that uh, seems to um, facilitate the control of infection, in, in, uh, mainly some genetic uh, background, uh, HLA-V57, HLA-V27, protective molecules that help them to control infection. And uh, they are considered uh, as an example of, uh, of some kind of remission or a functional cure, and this is a promise that the functional cure could be achieved in HIV-infected patients. But uh, our interest was also to, to find out if this HIV controller status could be induced somewhat or could be found in, in some individuals. So um, this is the Visconti study that, is, uh, that in involves a lot of teams and is coordinated by Christine Rousseau and promoted by the NRS. And so we, have, uh, we were contacted by uh, some clinicians that had made some interesting observations in some individuals that seem to be controlling after treatment interruption. So we have uh, assembly, a, a court, a group of uh, such individuals. We have identified 20 in France uh, so far. We have uh, included in the study 14 already, and the most uh, interesting characteristic in all these 14 patients is that they were uh, treated very early after infection. In median 40 days after infection, they start uh, at just a standard uh, antiretroviral therapy. They keep this antiretroviral therapy for a median of three years, so it was a, a long uh, therapy started in primary infection, and they have been able to control off therapy for a median of seven years. So um, we compared these individuals to uh, spontaneous HIV controllers, and the, the, the first thing that we observe is that they have um, much higher viral loads and symptomatic primary infection, that uh, HIV controllers, that actually they lack uh, mostly these uh, protective molecules that I told you before. And actually they have some molecules that are uh, more associated to a rapid progression and that are excluded in, in, in HIV controllers. So uh, we believe that this is uh, really a promising group of patients because they didn't have 
the characteristics that uh, have been associated to, to the HIV control status, uh, including a strong and efficiency detail response. And so we decided to, to, to study uh, these individuals because we thought that this could be a way to, to, to enlarge or to, to, uh, to be able to help uh, patients that were not, uh, that didn't have the chance in primary infection or the characteristics in primary infection to, to control infection to reach this level uh, of, of control of therapy. Uh, so we found out that, uh, like HIV controllers, they have very, very weak viral reservoirs, that in some cases this viral reservoir is decreasing over time, even in the absence of therapy. And we thought that perhaps this uh, decreasing in the viral reservoir could be due to a particular distribution of this reservoir. And uh, this is the, the work that uh, Charlene Bacuse in Brigitte uh, Otran uh, unit will be presenting this afternoon at uh, 2.30. And uh, what uh, it was found in this, in this uh, sub-study of the, of the viral reservoir is that very interestingly, in uh, patients in the Visconti study, uh, the larger contribution to the viral reservoir is found in, in uh, cells that are shorter lived and uh, the, that uh, longer lived uh, cells that could contain the virus are uh, contributing very uh, few to the, to the viral reservoir. So this could be explain how in a context where viral replication is uh, controlled, um, the reservoir could be decreasing in some individuals because we are, lucky, uh, we are losing these uh, short uh, uh, leaf uh, cells. And we are also um, actually uh, intrigued by, by this phenomenon that we see in, in patients treated in primary infection and we are conducting some epidemiological uh, studies uh, trying to, to assess which is the, the, the frequency of this, of this phenomenon. So we have interrogated different, different databases uh, in, in France, and we have uh, arrived to, the, to, to, uh, to a, a preliminary um, frequency, and is that uh, in patients that have been treated very early in primary infection and that they have kept this treatment for at least 12 months, the frequency of patients who will be able to control for at least two years of therapy could be uh, between 5 and 15%. So it's uh, a small frequency of uh, patients who will be able to control. We are obviously trying to, to uh, understand why some of these patients control after treatment interruption, why others don't. But uh, in any case, it seems like, like a larger fraction of patients who will be able, who would be able to control spontaneously and uh, who are called HIV controllers. Mm -hmm.